everybody, welcome back to Alan Walls Photography. I am Alan and today we're talking about lighting for indoor macro photography. So we've spent quite a bit of time talking about lighting for outdoor macro photography and it is a, a pretty important subject. It's pretty much everything really. And uh, outdoor lighting can be really, really difficult. Uh, knowing when and how to add flash and uh, how to use the available light to the best of your ability all takes a lot of practice. And quite frankly, there are days that uh, it's pretty much impossible to get the kind of photograph you want when you're outdoors at the, uh, uh, at the whim of the elements. But that is not the case indoors. When we're, when we're indoors, we can pretty much control everything about the lighting. And uh, I, I feel like we've kind of skimmed over it in the past. We haven't really had a, a good hard look at what our options are. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through the considerations I think are important for indoor macro lighting. And then I'll show you a few tricks on how to get some uh, useful macro effects. Okay, so light for photographers is either flash or continuous light. Uh, we're talking now about artificial light anyway. So flash is pretty much what uh, I think most of us working indoors use most of the time. The reason is that the, the light is very predictable. Uh, a good light system, whether it's a, a studio lighting setup or a uh, set of speed lights or one of these miniaturized uh, studio lighting setups that is a fake it's not real i wish it was real um, but we're, we're either going to be using flash or continuous and the reason i think most people go with flash is because color reproduction is predictable you don't get a lot of variation from flash to flash on the color temperature. Uh, and most of the decent flashes out there are gonna give you the same intensity uh, with each firing of the uh, strobe. So besides flash, there are several other kinds of lighting that you're commonly gonna encounter. Some of which have relatively little importance in photography and some of which have a lot. The first kind is the old fashioned incandescent light bulb. That is uh, an element, a little tiny piece of wire inside a vacuum. That's the light bulb that when you pass electricity through it, it glows, it gets hot. But part of, uh, part of its process of heating up in the vacuum is it gives off energy as light. Problem with it in photography is uh, it's, it's not consistent uh, in its light temperature it varies from bulb to bulb from manufacturer to manufacturer um, and uh, it's cumbersome to work with and it's hot so not something we use a lot another form of lighting very common uh, everywhere is uh, fluorescent lighting fluorescent lighting something like this uses um, an inert gas uh, that that fills the hollow glass but when current is passed through this gas, whether it's neon or uh, any of the other noble gases, uh, the gas will glow. But there are real good uses for these. These, these make excellent uh, light sources for large diffused light using a big softbox. I have a softbox somewhere around here that holds four of these things and it's massive but it will give a very nice shadowless glow over a large area. So there are times when I like to use it for macro. And that leaves us with the, the most useful and the most adaptable, flexible light uh, for indoor work. And that is LED light. LEDs give you a, just a tremendous amount of uh, flexibility. Now, I use LEDs all the time and I use them in all manner of different ways. I, I use flashlights sometimes to get specific effects, usually with a filter or uh, some type of modifier on the end. 
but my favorite thing of all are these, these things. These are fantastic for creating very unique balanced light uh, effects. Um, and um, I'll, I'll show you how we use these uh, in just a minute. Another thing that LEDs are fantastic for is getting very specific concentrated spots of light. Uh, I, I won't be demonstrating this technique today because it's sunny outside and I don't have a dark enough room to do this in. But I will take a, this, this is a, a cheap, tiny little flashlight, LED flashlight with a single battery in it. And I wrap foil around it and I put one of those metal drinking straws in it. And you would not believe what a fantastic little light source this is working in a completely dark room with a, uh, a, a long, long exposure time uh, and, and painting the light onto, onto my subject. So I, I show you that just to show you how incredibly flexible LED light is. Remember that photography is an art. It's, it's the way you express yourself. So the way you use these lights, the way you, uh, the way you set up your lighting is very much your expression of, of, of your art. And to that end, there really aren't any rules. If it looks good, use it. And there are so many ways that we can vary the light, the direction of light, the intensity of light, the color of the light, that you really need to, to experiment and see what, see what gives you images that, uh, that you have in your mind that you want to share with people. There is one thing that may be almost like a rule, though it's not really a rule because there are exceptions to it, but it's generally not a good idea to mix types of light. The main reason is you, you get color casts when you're using different energies of light, different colors of light. Um, so bear that in mind. So let's start by just setting up a really basic flash setup and uh, show you how that looks. And then we'll go on from there to try some more interesting things. So probably the most basic way to set up your uh, indoor macro lighting is to use a couple of speed lights like we talked about. Uh, usually I try to use one of them as a main light, uh, as a key light, and one of them as a fill. Uh, oftentimes I'll have the light coming from different complementary directions, and my camera settings will be pretty much standard for using an off-camera speed light. The sync speed for the shutter speed, in this case, it would be 1 250th of a second. Though with other cameras, that would be uh, that would depend on on your camera sync speed. Then uh, the uh, aperture I usually set around f8 because that's going to give me the the sharpest images and the best compromise on depth of field. And I'd keep the ISO at a hundred. And really, it's the light and how I set and position the speed lights that is going to determine. Uh, the outcome of the image. And you just need to experiment with this. I usually would recommend in this type of setup that you use some type of diffuser, either one of my homemade diffusers or a softbox, uh, a mini softbox in varying sizes. If you don't have one of these, <clears throat> a sheet of glass that uh, has some frosting on it, either stuff you put on it, or you can buy frosted glass or even frosted acrylic. Just a, a surface like that will greatly diffuse the light uh, if you place your, uh, your speed light behind it. So this is all pretty basic. This is, this is how we would normally set things up. We could also add grids if we wanted to get a more directional um, uh, light on the, the subject. The background is going to be very much out of focus, but it is certainly still going to be visible. You're going to, you're going to see the background 
uh, even though it'll be uh, blurry and uh, the, the color will depend largely on where you have your flash settings and the direction you have them pointed in. Uh, they won't drop off completely by the time the light gets to the backboard, so it's something to be aware of. But let's say we wanted to get a photograph of our subject and we wanted the, the background to be completely white. If I photograph it like so with the, with the two speed lights, this is not going to be white. It's going to be some off color, some shade, uh, but depending on how much stray light can get to it and light it. So in order to create a beautiful, completely white background, I would recommend putting in a couple of flags to separate the foreground from the background. Now, I have a trick that I use for getting these things to stand up. If you just take a, if you just take a, a large woodworking clamp and lay it on the table, and clamp the uh, board, it'll stand perfectly upright. So what I recommend you do is position one of these on one side of your subject, put another one on the other side. I'm going to do these at an angle because I don't have the table space for it. Something like that should be fine. We're going to be shooting right through that. Okay, good. And then if we take one of our speed lights and position it right behind the card and point it at the, at the back card, which is white, then by positioning my plane like so, and adding a little power with a one speed light, or two if you have another one, but in such a way that this doesn't become a silhouette. The brighter the light is in the back that's lighting up the white card, the less, um, uh, the less exposure you're going to get on your subject. And this is a matter of finding out what the right balance is. So. I would start normally with this at the same power as I, uh, I had before for the, for the uh, key light and the light in the back would be um, about quarter power usually for a setup like this. And then we'll take the picture, see what we get. So let's say instead we wanted to get a background that was completely black. The setup is slightly different. What we would do, let me show you what's going on behind the scenes here. We're going to need these again. But what I would do to create a completely black background, to have our lighted subject showing up but no lighting on the background, would be I would switch to a black background. Now, I have a, a, a nice piece of velvet that I normally use, um, but any material that absorbs light, like this cheap stuff, craft material that you can get at uh, just about any shop, this is a fairly good absorber. This black card is not, and uh, even if it's just slightly in focus, you're going to see texture on that. But if this is our black background and we try to shoot this now, plenty of light would, would get by our subject and illuminate the backdrop, and it wouldn't look good. It wouldn't look black. It would look uh, grayish, uh, and you'd see the texture in the paper. So what we would do in that situation is position our, our back as far back as we can get it and still have it in the frame. We take one of our flags and we try to position these pretty flat because you'll see why. 
And then if we frame our subject directly in front of the gap, you want to keep these as close together as you can without showing up in the photograph. There we go. So, subject is here. No light is going to get through there because we're going to position our flashes far more to the sides. So negligible amounts of light will just basically reflections from the rim of the card and it won't be enough to see. So we can light our image now and get a completely black background with no light spillage whatsoever. And this works just as well with continuous light as it does with flash. Very effective uh, technique. Okay, what else? What else can we do with a, a, a flash? One of, uh, one of the things I like to do that's um, a lot of fun is to illuminate objects. This is mostly for translucent objects. Illuminate them from below. Uh, it's not going to work, obviously, for, for everything that you're trying to do. But there are some, uh, I'll put up a picture here of a, a grasshopper that I uh, photographed sitting on a tea strainer, which was placed over a light source pointing straight up. I added some, uh, some lights above as well. But you can see here in this photograph uh, the effect of getting some lighting from below. Now, I don't like using flash from below as much as I like using um, continuous light. But let me show you uh, how I would do it anyway. I have a piece of foam that we've used for various other activities. Uh, in fact, I made soft box, uh, diffusers out of this particular piece. Uh, but I have cut a small hole in the center. And what you can do is position, position the card over the flash. Generally speaking, I would recommend putting a diffuser on it first and then positioning the, positioning the card with the hole on the top of it. Something like that making sure that there is no light leak around the edges. And when you fire this, it will put a, a fine beam of light up through the bottom of something. I've got something translucent here that I, I grabbed to use. These things, they're air freshening beads. They don't work, but they take great photographs. So simply by positioning it like so, and then, of course, the camera would be pointing through it, you could illuminate the whole thing from below. And I'll show you some examples of what that would look like. So the sky is the limit. You can add as many flashes as you want. You can add gels. Uh, you can add reflectors. In fact, I use reflectors a lot. I have all all different kinds of reflectors that have varying degrees of reflective surfaces. Uh, this is a uh, painted with a little silver acrylic on a piece of acrylic uh, card uh, that uh, has a nice flat silver uh, look to it, especially from, from behind. But I also, I buy things at the, at the dollar shop that are shiny. It's just... <laughs> I'm just attracted to shiny things, but these, whatever they I have no idea what they actually are, but these lovely pieces of foil make awesome reflectors, and you can position them just off camera and get some really interesting highlights that way. I also love this, this highly reflective gold um, reflector, which works fantastic with flash and with continuous light and a, a matte version, which doesn't reflect quite as, as harsh 
a light. So anything that you can do with a, with a regular speed light, uh, you can do with macro speed lighting. You just have to be conscious of these various tricks. So let's talk about the continuous lighting. With continuous lighting, we have, I think, a lot more creative potential. There's a lot of really interesting things that you can do. What you need to remember, though, is that if you're doing focus stacking, which you often will be, the lighting must stay the same. So it's really important that uh, you don't move the lights or change the lights at all during your, your focus stack. I know that goes without saying, but, but there you go. Now, I have tons of different LED lights that I use for my macro stuff. And it really depends what I'm trying to achieve. Some of the ones I use most commonly, I have several of these which are uh, very, very bright multi-LED systems that have a dozen or so bright LEDs. Uh, I disassembled them. They had all kinds of brackets and things on them, but I stripped them down so that I can attach them to my own. I, I have a cage that I will dangle them from and, and position them out of the way of my subject. It takes a little bit of setup, and these are very, very bright. These would have to be used either from a significant distance back or with uh, some, some good diffusion. Uh, but they, there are times when these, when these will come in handy. Um, far more likely, I will use smaller, softer light sources. And this is, this is one that I particularly like. I have no idea who makes it. I'm sorry. It's, um, it, uh, it, it's just a, a very inexpensive LED. And it has a nice clamp and a stiff bendy arm on it. This is tremendous for uh, some unusual types of effects like bottom lighting. And that's what I mainly use this for. It has an opaque disc um, over the, the light bulbs. It has a bunch of LEDs in there of differing temperatures. That's how you can get those two effects. Anyway. I like this partly because you can change the color of the light, but also because it's flat and it is a great way to bottom light things. So I'll use one of these, these lamps just clamped in position like this and I'll put my subject right on top of the thing, light it up and it's, it's great. Another thing I'll do is um, I, I, I'll take ping pong balls, um, the, you know, the table tennis balls, and cut them in half carefully with a sharp knife. And I'll put one half, and it almost fits in the top of this thing. And that makes for a wonderful glowy diffusion ball. To, uh, you, can, you can then take a pin uh, and, and secure your subject to the top of the, the ping pong uh, ball. And you get this lovely uh, diffused lighting coming from all angles. Probably the most versatile and uh, handy lighting for, uh, for indoor macro using LEDs is with these de delightful creatures. These come from um, Ikea. Uh, they are obscenely inexpensive. I think when I bought them, they were on sale for seven dollars each, and they uh, they plug into the wall. They have an adapter on them, and they put out a relatively low but very consistent light. And they have a little lens on the front to spread it just a little bit. But I have a box of these. I bought them while they were on sale, and on my my one of my old macro platforms, I built these ridges uh, because they're perfect for holding these clips, which will allow me to position my subject. My camera, camera will be back here. Um, this is not the one I'm currently using, but it's, uh, it's a, a good to show you what I'm talking about. I positioned my subject wherever I wanted it. I think I had it 
yeah, something like that, just as an example. And I can move the light pretty much anywhere I can bend them to. And the sky's the limit. I mean, there is, there is almost nothing you can't get them to do. So that you can, you can light from both sides, from under, from the top. Uh, I, I've done some setups where I have four or five of these, these lights highlighting specific parts of my subject. So this is an incredibly inexpensive and very effective way to create very novel and unusual lighting. I like this for very, com uh, very colorful insects. Uh, and uh, shiny insects because I can position the light to get exactly the reflections that I want. This beetle, for example, was shot using these lights, uh, several of them. I wasn't able to get the blue in the legs to show up. Uh, the, the beetle is green and under flash, the whole thing looked green. It looked shiny, but it looked green. Using these lights at several uh, different key points, I was able to bring out that rich blue color uh, in the bug's legs. And uh, this, this was how I, how I did that. A great many of my focus stacked images are lit like this. Uh, I just really like this effect. Uh, I shoot in RAW, of course, so I can make fairly significant changes uh, as need be to the, to the white balance. Uh, but um, yeah, th this really opens up a whole world of, of creative lighting. And I showed you earlier how I'll use the flash from below. This is where it really shines, is using one of these as a bottom light. Um, and it's as simple as that. Uh, I position the light right over the, right over the uh, hot un under the hole, tape it in place, and then put whatever translucent object I want to illuminate right on top of the hole. And you can see that it gives a really unique kind of lighting. And because it's continuous, you can see what you're going to get. There's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of uh, trial and error. These work just as well uh, with the gels as a flash does, though these are multi-layered that I put together for, um, for using with studio lights. I would just use a single sheet of gel. And I don't buy gel. I buy it. I buy this really, really cheap um, wrapping paper. Let me show it to you. This stuff costs about 79 cents for a roll of it. And it's a, oh, I don't know, a million square meters of the stuff in each roll. And uh, it, they have every color under the sun, red, blue, green, orange, you name it. Just go to a wrapping paper shop and they'll have these. I just, I can't see spending any more than this for the gels, but uh, you can even combine these and get interesting colors. So there's one other thing that I should mention about using continuous LEDs. The light output from these is pretty low, which means you're going to have to be far more careful about your camera settings. Now, I still recommend leaving your ISO as low as possible, but you're able to reduce your shutter speed down as low as a half a second or even a second. Uh, aperture is a little bit more problematic. Uh, you really cannot shoot closed down when you're using a system like this. You just don't get enough light uh, into the camera. So uh, I particularly like using this kind of lighting either for very, very tiny objects uh, that, I can, that I can get in focus uh, as much as I want to, 
uh, or if I'm focus stacking. Sometimes when I focus stack, I move the subject instead of the camera. Uh, it depends on the type of shot. Uh, it doesn't really make any difference, but if you are moving the specimen to and from the camera, you must make sure that your lights are attached to the same platform. In other words, something that when you turn the dial to move your focus rail, the lights are coming with you. You cannot move or replace the lights at all because you'll get, uh, you'll get photographs in your stack that look completely different. So that's worth mentioning. Uh, other camera settings, unlike with, um, unlike with using flash, of course, the aperture isn't just uh, something you use to keep ambient light out. The aperture is going to have to be set to get enough light in. So uh, I would usually recommend shooting with uh, a fairly open aperture of maybe 5.6, 7.1 with this camera and uh, going with as long a shutter speed as you need. And obviously, long exposures, low light, stable platform. You have to be, if you have somewhere in your house or studio that has concrete floors, that is the best way to use this kind of light because any movement is going to add blur to your images and if they're part of a focus stack, it'll ruin the whole shot. So if you're going to use continuous light and you're going to use low power positionable continuous light like I am recommending, then just make sure you have a stable shooting platform and uh, you're not moving the camera at all. I want to encourage you to experiment and try out different things. Uh, you'll try things and they'll look just terrible. I mean, I have I have tried to light things with every conceivable uh, source of light you can imagine, and most of them do look just rubbish. But this type of setup doesn't, and uh, it's cheap, it's quick, it's easy, and it'll let you get into a realm of macro that, that you might not have even considered before, and, and that of adding creative lighting. If you buy some of these bendy lights, from IKEA if they still make them um, and you don't like them for your macro um, lighting, you can clip them on the head of your bed. I think that's what they're made for and you can read by them. How's that for a bargain? You can't try reading by speed light. <laughs> You'd have to be a speed reader to do that. Anyway, there's one other device, if you can call it a device, that I would recommend you think about getting. It's something that you can make, and if you guys want me to show you how to do it, I'll be happy to. Leave me a message if, if it's anything that interests you. But when I'm doing a multi-LED uh, creative lighting with my macro, I really like to have a, a very stable frame to put my lights on. With two lights, it's fine using something like this, this macro platform. It's great, it's convenient, it's easy, but you can't get all of the camera and all of the lighting angles that you might want. It's terribly easy to do to build a cage out of PVC or any kind of pipe you might have lying around uh, or wooden dowels even. Uh, very straightforward to build a square cage that has uh, nice sturdy cross beams on it uh, that these lights can be hung from. It gives you more. It gives you more angles that you can come at the specimen with, uh, and less likelihood of accidentally photographing part of a bendy arm. So if that's something that interests you, let me know. I will be happy to build one of those for you and show you how it's done in a video. By the way, I didn't mention this. I used a macro lens today. You absolutely don't have to. You could have used any of the, of the lens arrangements we've talked about in the past. Uh, of course, 
this is one of the real advantage of, advantages of these bendy arm LEDs, is you can get these lights in really tight spaces where you might have difficulty getting a flash if you're working with a lens setup that gives you a short working distance. But give it a try. I think you'll like it. And if you do and you take some nice pictures, please send them to me. My website is alanwallsphotography.com. And if you go over there, um, just uh, there's a way you can get in touch with me from there and you can send me a picture. I'm going to gather them up and do a video uh, about you guys and your pictures. So uh, if you want to give me a bit of information about what you're sending and, uh, and who you are, I'll make sure I put all that together into a fun video in a couple of months time when we have uh, enough images to look at. Thanks for dropping by. Always good to see you. I'll see you again in a few days. Until then, cheerio.